Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this evening study. It's 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 a Friday night study, and uh, it's not Sabbath yet here, but we'll be in about twenty minutes or fifteen twenty yeah fifteen minutes almost. Now we're going to pick up where we left off last week, and as we're going to look at this argument, uh, which which I think is kind of interesting because it's an argument that. Uh, that Stephen Jameson addressed back in 2018, and we're going we're gonna to look at that. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for the time that we have to study together. And uh, we know, Lord, as we look at E.J. Wagner's confession of faith, we know that this is not a happy topic, because we know that there are people who who once knew the truth, who leave that truth for various reasons. And um, we know, Lord, that we don't want to do that, but we won't want to be faithful. We know, Lord, that without your spirit working upon our hearts, without your strength and the faith of Christ given to us as a gift, uh, that we'd be, we would be in the same boat. We pray for one another. We pray for this movement. And we ask, Lord, that as we open your word together, as we look at um, parts of our, our history, we pray that um, we can understand and that we can give be given faith to endure the trials before us. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening again, everyone. So, so last week we were uh, continuing to read Wagner's Confession of Faith. And looking at some of the arguments that he was using against the 2300 days. And, and he's going to use one here that, that I think is very interesting. So back when I originally read this, uh, would have been, I don't know, this when I was first in Adventist, uh, probably, you know, 1986. I, I read this, Wagner's Confession of Faith. So a long time ago. I, I wouldn't have picked up on this. But now, based upon uh, what Stephen presented in 2018, which we're going to look at, we have this. Uh, there's something about this here that I think we need to pay attention to. That we might we might um, notice something. So he's going to make uh, an argument about what he sees as an inconsistency. So he says, "Let me note, by the way, an inconsistency on the part of those who insist that everything must." Fit the type, he has in quotation marks. In the type, the atonement day was just one day out of 360 days, the last day of the year. According to SDA teaching, Christ was in the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary from his ascension till 1844, or 810 years, which time corresponded to the yearly service in the tabernacle leading up to the day of atonement. The 810 years correspond to 359 days in the type. So what he's saying is simply there's 359 years or 359 days. Now, that isn't quite exactly true. I mean, there would be on average because we know that a Jewish year can be 353 days, 354, 355, 383, 384, 385. Right. Because there's never a year of 360 days. But he's using this prophetic year symbol. So he's saying there's 359 days in the type. Uh, now, 359 days is to one day as 810 years is to five years and 15 days. So simply what he's doing is he's taking 1844 years. Right. So you got from, uh, or pardon me, you got, I have to think, think how, how he's doing this. So you got 810 years, right? So 810 years or 1810 years, pardon me, 1810 years of 359 days. And then you would have, uh, so I'm trying to think how, how we would do this. I, I didn't think this through yet. The way that he's doing it is different. Because we counted the actual days, right? Or Stephen did. 
So he's saying there's going to be 810 years, but those are 810 um, uh, solar years, right? So if you if you had if you had 810 or 1810. So if I did 1810 times 360, so let's let's do some of the math here together. So here I, I just did 1810 times 360, and that's going to be 651,600 days, right? Now, obviously, that there is 365 days in a year. So I could go uh, 365.25 times 800, 1810. And you would see I'd get a, mu a much larger number. That's actually going to be about, I guess, that's what, 9,500 days roughly difference, right? Because that's simply taking 5.25 times 1810, right? So, yeah, so that's right. So he's not being very precise here. Now, what Stephen Jameson did, is he actually counted the number of days. So I'll show you that. Okay, so here we have, um, I'm just gonna clear all this. So we're gonna go to uh, 31 AD, and we're going to go to the month of June, and we're gonna go to Sivan 6, and you're gonna see on the Julian calendar, that's gonna be June 17th, right? And then and I can just simply put, 1844 in here so that's that's going to be pentecost so that when that's when christ he ascends into heaven 10 days before that but alan white says that it's on the day of pentecost and the holy spirit is poured out that christ be, it begins his work in it's an inaugur inauguration of his work in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary as a high priest so i mean he's gonna there's gonna be a celebration when he goes into heaven but on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out. So we would count then to 1844, uh, the 10th day of the seventh month, right? So to October 22nd. Now, it's going to be October 10th on the Julian, but so one's a Julian date and one's not. And so then if you count the number of days here, it's going to give us a count of six, 662,314 days. It's a lot of days. Okay. I'm going to switch to screens here. So there you see that number. But you can see that that number is larger than these other two numbers. So it's, it's a bit larger than this one because this was really would be counting from the 10th day of the seventh month or actually October 22nd or whatever it would be in 31 AD to October 22nd in 1844, right? So it's it's going to be less. It's, it's about 1,200 days less than than this other number. So because one is it's it's um, so 810, and I think he's counting from the end of the 70 weeks too. He's not even counting from the cross because if he counted from the cross, wouldn't it be 813 Wagner. years? Wagner, yeah. So Wagner's he's not even counting from the cross. He's just counting from the end of the 70 weeks. So, so he's not being correct, right? So there, there would actually be another three years in there because he's wondering how could it be so much different? So he should have used eight, 1813 years because Christ doesn't begin his work in the heavenly sanctuary at the end of the 70 weeks. It's in the midst of the week. Okay. But he does make an interesting point. He says that if you had 359 days in a year, so that is if we took a prophetic year, and we took out one of those days, we we would we would have we what we could do, I believe, is we just divide this by 359. And then what you get is you get 1844. So this is, and we'll see that this is what Stephen sent to Jeff. And then we have a fraction. Now that fraction is written as a decimal on my calculator, but I, I could take that. So I can, I'm going to subtract the 1844, right? So that's, um, and you'll see what I'm doing here in a bit. And I'm just going to see how much that is longer than 1844. And, and I would multiply this then by 359 and I get 318. So what is it about the number 318 that we see? 
how long should be the vision concerning the deity to give both this and the abomination and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden on your foot? That's Palmonai. One saint spake unto a certain saint, right? The Palmonai. This is Daniel 8.13. It's just in reverse, right? The question, right? So what's that? Somebody said three. Okay, yeah. Right. So it's it's the symbol for Palmonai, but in reverse, right? So we have this this eighteen forty four number. So if we count the number of days, we divide it by three fifty nine. Uh, we have um, this uh, remainder. Okay. Now the other thing that we can see is that we have also eighteen hundred and forty four days that are left over in that period of time that are the days of atonement. That is, you're going to have 1,844 days of atonement, right? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Because even though we, we, we are counting from 31 AD, right, there isn't 1,844 years from 31 AD. There's only 1,813 years. The thing is we're not using... Um, 365 days a year, we're using six prophetic years, right? So the idea then is that in a prophetic year, uh, we're going to have less, we're going to have more years in that same span of time. So if, if, if somebody was using a 360 day calendar in 1813 years, they would have, they would have had, uh, 1844 years and 318 days. Well, I guess, the 318 is, is kind of because we're not starting on the same date. So if we started on the same date and the same date, it'd be 1844 years and a certain number of days, whatever that would be from whatever, you know, if you're counting the same date, probably be about, uh, I could roughly say it's about almost like an extra half a year, right? So 1844 years and a half or something like that. Let me think. Is that right? Well, that's with the 359 days. So anyway, the point is we have 1,844 days left over. Now, he says we have about five years, right? So in his rough estimate that he's doing here, he's saying there's 810 years to the end of the 70 weeks. It's not considering the cross itself or when Christ begins his work in the heavenly sanctuary. And then you're just saying it's about five years. Okay, so it's actually a little bit more than five years. 1844, if we, if we divide it by five, we're going to get 368.8, right? Or if we d- divided it by 365.25, you're going to see you're going to get five years in a decimal. So you subtract the five years, multiply that by 365.25, and you're going to get about, um, 15 to 18 days or something. Yeah. So about 18 days, right? 17.75 days. So if you count from October 22nd and you counted 18 days, what date would you arrive at? So remember there's uh, 31 days in October. So you got nine days left over and then another nine days. So you would end up on November 9th, right? Does that make sense to people? So it's five years from October 22nd, 1844, five years to October 22nd, 1849, right? What, Wagner, Wagner. And then, and then another 18 days would bring you to November 9th, 1949. Okay. Does that make sense? Did I explain that in a way that makes sense to people? Is this Wagner's view? Yeah, so, so Wagner doesn't quite do it that way, right? So he, he just, he says 800, 1810, not 1813, because he's not counting from Pentecost for some reason. He's just counting from the end of the 70 weeks. But it's an objection that he's making. So, so we're just going to look at what he says again. And we're going to look a bit more in detail what Stephen says. So he says this is this inconsistency on the part of those who insist that everything must fit the type. In the type, the atonement day was just one day out of 360 days. 
which of course we know is not quite true, the last day of the year. According to SDA teaching, Christ was in the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary from his ascension till 1844 or 1810 years. Well, really, it should be 1813 years, right? Because he didn't ascend into heaven in 34 AD. He ascended in uh, 31 AD. So it should be, I'm just going to put this in here, 1813 years. Okay. Which time co corresponded to the yearly service in the tabernacle leading up to the Day of Atonement. The 1810 years corresponded to 359 days in the type. Now, 359 days is to one day is 1810 years is to five years and 15 days. So so he's going to take 1810, right? And, and we took 1813. If you took 1813, it'd be five years and 18 days. So so it actually kind of does work here in, in this context. So I, I'm just going to put that here. So we're just going to put it. Okay, does that make sense? So, I, I mean, I'm putting some stuff here in this document that, uh, you know, he didn't put in. So it's, I'm an editor, right? Now, we already said, so if you counted from October 22, 1844, and you counted five years, that bring you to 1849, and he says that. So he says, therefore, if the type were to be followed exactly, the antitypical Day of Atonement ought to have ended sometime in 1849. Why insist on following the type so closely in other respects and ignore, ignore it in the important matter of time? So if we would have had five years and 18 days, as we noted, it would have ended on November 9th, 1849. Now, is that significant that we would have November 9th, 1849 as the date when the Day of Atonement should have ended? Now, I, I hate what ifs, but... But the what if question was or is, I mean, could Christ have come back before now? Most definitely. OK, so Christ should have come back in that history if the Millerite movement had continued in faith. That is, if all of the Millerites who had gone through that experience of October 22, 1844, had retained their faith, hadn't rejected July 18, 2020. I mean, October 22nd, 1844. Christ would have come back in that history. Correct? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. They had all kinds of light that they could have found if they had been faithful. I believe the spirit of prophecy says you're right about that. Yeah, she says that. So, so it's really possible. Christ could have come back November 9th, or at least he could have close probation on November 9th, 1849. But we do know a number of things. One is time is no longer. So, you know, and this is a problem that I have with, with people who are always, so, so back in the 1990s, people were looking at uh, James Usher's chronology and saying, well, 6,000 years is going to end like in 1995 or 1996, right? And believing that there's 6,000 years from creation to the second coming. The Bible doesn't say that. We do know there's 6,000 years of sin that is allotted. So whenever man first sinned, I mean, technically, we were given 6,000 years before the millennium would be begin. But we also know time has been extended. That God's, God has extended pro probation because of his mercy. But we don't have time after October 22nd, 1844. That is, we don't have a time prophecy where we can predict any of the events, the close of probation, the loud cry, the, the Sunday law, the second coming, or any prom promise of special significance. Because there was these time prophecies that ended in 1844. The time prophecy wasn't telling us when Jesus was going to return. It was telling us when judgment was going to begin. And so we're in a, a period of time called the Day of Atonement. We know that as Seventh-day Adventists. Now, to say that it ought to have ended sometime in 1849, I agree. But God is not tied to that. So he's arguing that if we insist on the type, you know, that we it has to be that way. 
But that doesn't really make sense. And, and this type of argument, no pun intended, these are the types of arguments that are occurring within the movement presently. And they don't make any sense. So people are expecting things to happen a certain way. Something that they have an idea of how things are supposed to happen. And when things don't happen that way, uh, they bring a criticism upon God. Now, God's plans are much better than our plans. God knows the end from the beginning. He knows how things ought to be. That is, there's God's uh, perfect will. And there's also God's will. Man gets in the way of God's perfect will at times, right? His ideal for humanity. Because God doesn't want, you know, anybody to be lost. And yet people will be lost. So people can step outside of that. That will, because he's given us a will, a free will. But God's will will still be done. And so God has been dependent upon humanity. But um, I'm going to look now just at what Stephen did um, back in 2018. So I had written Stephen on October 21st, 2018, or maybe even before that. So so you can I, I'm going to show you this email. Um, but I'm going to make it so, uh, you know, see Stephen's email. Just, I don't think he cares, but just move that around a bit. Okay. So what you see here is, um, it's, uh, an email entitled 359 days. So he says, hello, Theodore. I've been interested in your presentations about November 9th and the close of probation. So these are the presentations I did at the camp meeting. So he's going to e email this to me on the 21st is when it's dated of October of 2018. So this is going to be the day after the camp meeting. So on that day, I'm actually uh, driving to uh, Dallas and then flew over to uh, back to Edmonton briefly on, on that date uh, to be in court on October 22nd, 2018. Dallas, Oregon. Dallas, Oregon. What's that? I would, so we're in Arkansas. I was in Arkansas. Uh, yeah. So we had the camp meeting in Arkansas there. So that's the one where I did the presentations on uh, the week of Christ. And then I did some presentations on um, the 391 and a half days. So I did two presentations on that. And then a, a brief presentation during one of Parminder's presentations. He gave me 15 minutes to... Uh, present about the 9-11 prayers. But so anyway, Stephen had seen these. And so he, he wrote me. Um, he said, I'd emailed Jeff a follow-up email soon after he presented what I had shared with him about Christ's days in the holy place when he was in Canada. But I do not think it made much of an impression on him at the time. So in Canada, this would have been August um, 8th to 15th, I believe. Uh, something like that. Try to think of the dates. Maybe 11th to 15th. I think it was August 11th to 15th that Jeff was there in, in 2018. He was in Alberta here. And, um, he presented what Stephen had presented. Right. So he, he was pretty excited about this and I was interested in it. I thought, well, this, this is kind of interesting, but I didn't quite understand how Stephen did it. I didn't quite understand the math and some of the conclusions that he drew. So he says, um, when I added the 1844 days to October 22, 1844, on the online date calculator, it came to November 9th, 9, 1849. I related 49 to 490 or the close of probation. This was the email. So this is what he sent to Jeff. Just an additional related thought concerning this time symbolized for Christ in the most holy place. I've been watching some of Brother Parminder's presentations in France based upon the following statement by Alan White, originally written in 1883. He has suggested that the Lord may have intended to return in 1863. Uh, had Adventists, after the Great Disappointment in 1844, held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming it to the world. They would have seen the salvation of God. The Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts and the work uh, work would have been completed. And Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. But in the period of doubt 
and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Dissensions and divisions came in. The majority opposed with voice and pen the few who, following in the providence of God, received the Sabbath reform and began to proclaim the third angel's message. Many who should have devoted their time and talents to the one purpose of sounding warning to the world were absorbed in opposing the Sabbath truth, and in turn, the labor of its advocates was necessarily spent in answering these opponents and defending the truth. Thus, the work was hindered, and the world was left in darkness. Had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history? With an exclamation mark. And we can say the same thing about this movement. I mean, right? So there was a period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment of July 18, 2020, right? And the majority definitely opposed with a voice, pen, and the internet, right? The few that were following in the providence of God. We believe that God was leading us. And God has given us light because there was light to be had. But this work has been hindered. So so we can see definitely the parallel there. So one of the things we will we'll say here, um, when, well, we'll read what Stephen says and we'll say a bit more. So the Day of Atonement on the Hebrew year template would begin on October 22, 1844 and end 1844 days later on the 9th of November, 1849. Based on the above Ellen White quote and the 359 one template, so 359 days in the holy place and one day in the most holy. I would like to suggest that it was God's intention that Christ's work in the most holy place come to an end in 1849, <laughs> 49 representing the end of forgiveness, as Christ had said that we are to forgive our brother 70 times 7. Allowing some months for the seven last plagues, the second advent would have been in 1850, 50 representing the year of Jubilee. However, because the work was hindered and the world was left in darkness, the day of atonement was prolonged. So, so Stephen's conclusion is pretty much the same conclusion I had long before I knew about 1849 in reading Spirit of Prophecy. I really believed that Christ would have come back in that period of time, those, you know, first six years, maybe seven years. But because of, of unbelief, we've had to wander in the wilderness, right? We couldn't enter the promised land. So, but it's very interesting that we get this date, November 9th. Now, there's, I said pretty amazing stuff, huh? We are still in awe. And then I said, I had to research and write from Sabbath evening. So I'm just talking, it took about, see, I'm talking about preparing for the studies. Well, 60 hours of study in five days. Anyway, um, what's that? Allowing for the, allowing for the delay. Oh, I had, okay. I had to take it off. I had, I had to take it off and chuckle. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, so he says just a few things about the study of Christ days in the holy place and all the decimals that do not sit well with you. Because I have complaints about the decimals and so forth, right? So there's 662,314 days from Pentecost in 31 AD to October 22nd, 1844. And if you divide those by 359, rather than using the random decimals, equates to uh, 1,844 days, 21 hours, 15 minutes, and 33, or the 33rd second, right? So that means it's going to be 21 hours, 15 minutes, and the 33rd second equates to 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. when Christ died. As you know, the 1844 days equates to the Day of Atonement. 21 hours is 1,260 minutes, which equates to 1,260 days of Christ's earthly ministry as the Messiah. 15 minutes and the 33rd second equates to 1533 BC. And of course, all to the, also to the 1,533 days from, I'm just looking at Iran's uh, uh, chat there, 
So the 1,533 days from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844, which is a wonderful manifestation of the power of God that Ellen White compares to the Exodus, which occurred in 1533 BC. Of course, we do not have the information to know exactly when Christ died, but we can know that it is about 21 hours, 15 minutes, and the 33rd second. But I would like to add that Mark chapter 15, verse 33, interestingly brings us to the events of the ninth hour when Christ died, right? So the ninth hour is 21 hours because that's 12 hours plus nine hours is going to give you 21 hours, right? So it's nine. And and so it says, when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Thabachthani which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, behold, he calls, calleth Elias, or Elijah. And one ran and filled a, a sponge full of vinegar, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, let us alone, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. So the main verse there is, uh, it's going to be from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. And that's going to be, Mark chapter 15, verse 33. So it's kind of interesting uh, that these things happen. Now, um, so when we look at Wagner's objection, right? So he has this objection, but in this objection is hidden some very precious truth that there, that there was something under his nose that was under the nose of Adventists that they could have found, but they didn't, right? And Wagner, who's opposing the truth, notices this and uses it as an objection against the truth. Now, I did want to show you one more thing here, which... Uh, so... Yeah. So, I'm, so I'm, late, I'm late to class. What was the thing that uh, Wagner is saying in there that... Uh, when well, he's saying that Jesus, Jesus should have come back, you know, five years and 18 days after October 22nd, 1844. So he should have come back November 9th, 1849. Right. That's what he, he's, he's saying. He doesn't give the exact date, but if he, if he had done his math correct, he would have, he would have said, yeah, Jesus should have come back November 9th. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Theodore. Yeah. Believe it or not, I got some. The spam phone call interrupt what you were saying. <laughs> so I missed everything that you did. <laughs> okay. So Wagner is, is yeah, Wagner's doing this this count saying that Christ should have come back November 9th, 1849. Right? He says sometime. But if he does the math right, and, and Stephen did this math and showed that Christ uh, should have come back, you know, like based upon that idea. You know, at least the close of probation would have occurred on November 9th, 1849, I guess is really what we're saying. And that in 1850, you know, possibly Christ could have returned as early as 1850. But we're going to have instead in 1850, we're going to have a chart given to us. And that's because of the unfaithfulness of the Millerite movement. Okay, so. Okay, so it was uh, what year was it first? recorded that the Adventist church was becoming Laodicea and there had been. Was it James White, a James White quote? Yeah, well, James to White well. first talks about Laodiceans in 1850 in connection with the first day Adventists. Okay. And then leave. So they, they already start talking about Laodicean in 1850. I don't think they start mm-hmm. talking about it before that. And then it's going to be applied to the mm-hmm. Adventists. I believe about 1854 that it's going to be applied to to their movement itself. Because because to them, I mean, I mean to them they're they're like we are like they're part of a movement. To them they're 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 Millerites, right? They're Adventists in 1850. Right. So so he's saying that we have become Laodicean and, and it, as in. Adventists who went through the disappointment were now led to see it. But he's he's not making a distinction between, you know, his group and 
the majority of of Adventists, right? He's he's part of that same move. Yeah, yes, and <clears throat> Laodicea, and including the whole condition, like, and that's not an easy thing to actually come to a realization of personally. Well, and that's where <laughs> we're. I think all our hearts. That's why I love Friday night. Is it's about being converted and being like Christ. Really, I mean, that's the that's the substance of, that I get from all of these studies on Friday night. Okay. Yeah. Well. <sighs> And, and the thing is, there's lots, let me see here, I'm trying to find this other thing that I want to show you. I don't know if I, I should have actually got it um, earlier, but I didn't. I know I have the picture somewhere. I think it's here. While you're looking? I was, okay. Say something. Yeah. I was thinking of uh, the 164 and 165 presentations this past week. About okay. iterate and iterate and uh, not be, the former not being like the latter or the other yeah. way around. Yeah. Okay. So that question mm -hmm. that we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the differences that I I don't know where if I was out out in left field on this one, so I'm checking in with you. Yeah. If one of the differences is okay. So the papacy is put on the throne, taken off by atheism. 1798, time of the end. Former yeah. ladder shall not be like the um, So the other way around, it, it, well, this difference will be the papacy will not be taken off and it will defeat atheism or it will join atheism. Atheism will join the papacy. That's different. Atheism. Yeah. I, well, atheism, so atheism does join the papacy. I mean, it, I mean, because but it joins the papacy in the United States. Sorry? It's through the United States that they end up joining. Yeah. Yeah. They're the hub. Yeah. Well, I can't find this picture. It's not really that important right here in this discussion. So, so the basic idea here is that Christ could have come back ere this and, and that God's original plan probably was for that to occur. That Christ could have come back in 1850, and and then it would have followed the type would have followed it exactly. But one of the things that people make a mistake of is is that they think very simplistically. So a lot of the a lot of times when, when I first started studying this chronology, and even before, but when I really started getting into chronology back in uh, 2012, you know, people would have these very simplistic ideas of how you know, the structure of prophetic chronology would would be, right? You know, it's going to be like these regular jubilee cycles. And somehow they would think that, you know, God must do it in this way. And so even though reality says, you know, you can't put that date, that event on that date, there's too much evidence against it. They would say, well, it has to be that way. I don't care what the chronologists say. I don't care what the documents say. I have this pattern that I believe that God must have followed. And so everything's got to fit into this pattern. But when you look at the structure of prophetic chronology, as is in the Bible, it's extremely interconnected. It's wheels within wheels. And, and at first, it looks to be confusion. But as you start to look at it, you start to see design. And the complexity that exists within these prophetic periods shows that it's something that could not have occurred randomly. That is, it, it has design, just like our DNA does. So when he has this type of objection, he's judging God based upon human, human reason and expectations. But God's plan is much more interesting. So one of the things that we have is in our study, we, we found that there is from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month, it's 187 inclusive days, right? That is, if you count cardinally from April 19th, 1844 to October 22, it's going to be 186 days. That means October 22 is the 187th day of the year. That's where I first noticed the symbol of 187 before I even 
you know, connected it to July 18th or anything like that. So I knew about the number of days. But okay. we noticed in the week of Christ. What's that? Some, some random thing, but my ties today was 186. So that was <laughs> okay. It's interesting. Yeah. So anyway, what, what we have is we have um, uh, from the first day of the first month to the day of atonement, we have this 187 days. Now, if we were going to count, well, let's first look at the week of Christ study. We found that we could we could mark April 5th, 2030 as the first day of the first month. And then I noticed that if you counted from the first day of the first month in 1844 to the first day of the first month in 2030, it's exactly 186 years. That is, April 5th, 2030 is the 187th year from the first day of the first month in 1844. It also happens to be exactly 2300 months, not, not months on our calendar, but months on the lunar calendar, right? The actual months that you see in the sky, right? So it's 2300 months from April, April 19th, 1844 to April 5th, 2030. And it's also exactly 186 years. But also, it's 187 prophetic years and 20 prophetic months. So that's extremely bizarre that you can have these two symbols, no. 18620 and 186 and the 2300 all combined, plus the week of Christ points to it as well, the week of Christ study. And we found many other connections. We found that if you counted from 911, which is also a symbol of the first day of the first month, and you counted 354 days, which in the story of Ezra, it starts on the first day of the first month in 457, and it ends on the first day of the first month in 456. So if you count 354 months, it also brings you to April 5th, 2030. So, so these become extremely, so extremely unlikely. One is no person would ever conceive of this idea. That is, we discovered it. We didn't create it, right? All of these things. Like somewhere in a study, because that is rather amazing. Yeah, well, well, we, we've we've done lots of studies on it. If you look at the the notes from the camp meeting uh, that we had in August, um, that particular grouping just succinct like that. Yeah. Okay. I want to read. Okay. Well, I'll send you. I'll send you a text on Messenger. I'll send you a message in Messenger. How's that? I'll, I'll write it out for you. Yeah. So we have all of this evidence that points to April fifth, twenty thirty, as a symbolic date. We don't predict anything on that date. We don't know how, when Christ is going to come back. We don't know when probation is going to close. We don't know when the Sunday law is going to be. But we have as a symbol a date. In the future, right? And and that date confirms what we have been doing. Doesn't have to actually anything happen on that date. It's just it, it's a symbol, right? And so these symbols have shown that we have been doing things in a way that man could never. There's definitely you know nobody would be smart enough to figure this out. Plus, it also has to be based on reality, right? So. It, it, the way, and that's why we're doing the study on Sabbath, dealing with, um, and we're going to actually address this in, in the studies on Sabbath, uh, with the symbolic use of numbers. Um, the, put, it on a, put it on a line. So uh, I think Stephen put it on a line, didn't he? Uh, this, this study? Draw it, the, yeah, draw it on a line. He never drew it on a line for some reason. I, I don't know why. I mean, maybe he did in, in some diagram later, but. He didn't at the time. But anyway, so so we, Wagner is rejecting the 2300 days because he's trying to force God to be not like God. You understand what I'm saying? God has a way that he does things. And it's not the way that man does things. Because God is one merciful, man is not. Man is inflexible, God is. 
isn't inflexible. God adapts to the conditions that we give him, but his ultimately his will will be done. And, and I talked about his perfect will and his will. And, and I think his perfect will is actually the one that ends up in the end being done. And his will is the things that, that he wants to have happen, that God wills that all should be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Maybe that would be his perfect will. I don't know. But I would think his perfect will is what ends up happening. And that would be God's will. He wants things to happen a certain way. He loves us. But because he gave us free will, you know, his will can be transgressed, but his perfect will will not be. In the end, we will see that God's design and who is saved and who is lost that nobody can criticize it. Nobody will have an ability to bring any criticism against it. Even the wicked, even those that have had the judgment against them, they will accept it. Wagner will accept it. He, his knees will bow and his tongue confess. Okay. Now he says, now this is the one that I find of the most was, absurd. Yeah. And this, this delay is bubbly. But, uh, yeah, every knee shall bow, and, and it's willingly, um, mm-hmm. willingly. Well they're, well, they're forced because of the power of the truth. They I like the, I like the, the truth. God doesn't I like, like physics to force them down. <laughs> I like the description in the Great Controversy, uh, mm-hmm. where the wicked encompass the camp of the saints, and then they... Stand, it's a standoff, and then they rush the gates. And it's at that time that Jesus lifts his hand and says, Close the gates. Up until that time, before the whole universe, everybody, they were welcome to come in, but they didn't want to come in. Up to that very moment. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, God is extremely merciful. But when he closes probation, the reality is that no one will change from their wickedness and no one will change from their righteousness because God can read the heart. But he has not no. restricted, he has not restricted anyone. We have restricted ourselves. And that, that, that would be the demonstration to end all doubt. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay, now let's look at this argument of Wagner's against Adventism. But to come to the really serious indictment, um, I've said that the teaching that atonement for sins was deferred until 1844 and that no sins were blotted out till then, the sins of the living not being blotted out even yet, minimizes or even nullifies the value of the blood of Christ. It makes a distinction between uh, between things that do not differ and teaches that the blood, the life of Christ received by a person, exercises only a portion of its virtue at the time of its reception, that it is divided in its action. Now, this is, is quite a bizarre argument. I mean, we know that right now we are not, uh, that sin still exists in this world, right? Yeah. And that, that the blood of Christ has And even in the sanctuary, in the type, we see this. There is a process of time. The sins are going to be forgiven, but when are they blotted out? They're not blotted out in the daily service. They're blotted out on the day of atonement by the Lord's goat. And then those sins are going to be confessed upon the head of the scapegoat. So that to to believe that 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 everything that has that the blood of Christ. So one, he's arguing that Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So that means this has always been available. And that means that the work of Christ should have been completed before the creation of the world. That is, we shouldn't have sin presently. But we know that there comes a time when Jesus comes back and and makes ultimately an end of sin and sinners. And that's all because of the question. uh, Yeah. It's always available. Having been is it is it is an answer that possible that it has always been available by faith because the, of the Old Testament Christ had not yet been saved. so right. in that so, sense it is always a, right so are so, you because so, 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 I'm not quite sure 
<laughs> yeah, it's always been available by faith. That is, everybody who has ever been saved has been saved by faith in Christ. No one has ever been saved by works. We've all been saved by grace through faith, which worketh by love to the purifying of the soul. That has always been what? true. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that there is not times in which things unfold historically in the plan of salvation, right? Jesus does yeah, actually yeah. die on the cross. He didn't die, you know, he didn't die a second time on the cross and die at the beginning of the world. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world because he's promised from the foundation of the world. Yes. But he actually so, didn't die before the world was created. That uh, the differentiation or that some people differentiate it or is this what Wagner is doing? Well, well, he's just saying that always this has always been available. But so he's making he's arguing yeah. against himself. So if he's saying that at the day of atonement is 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 not needed, well, then the cross was not needed, right? No, it was got a plan. You, 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 you to. Yeah. So God's plan unfolds, and as God unfolds light, we we go into a different. You know, dispensation. It doesn't mean that people are saved by works in one dispensation and by grace in another, like the evangelicals do. People have always been saved by grace. God required the Jews to offer sacrifices. That was real. And their salvation was connected to trusting in what God had asked them to do and doing it. You know, well, the, oh, oh, it, it wasn't oh, works. It wasn't, it, you know, it was by faith. When they left no, Egypt. Well, the idea that Wagner said. Is that there is it if that it would even be possible to not need the atonement and so on? Is that what he's suggesting? What, what he's saying is that there's no need for any of this. I mean, he should be in consistently being saying there's no reason that Jesus ever needed to come. There's, there should have been no reason the Ten Commandments had to have been given, right? There would have been no reason for 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 sacrifices and offerings even to be given to Adam and Eve after they sinned, if he was consistent. So he's making an argument well, against the Day of Atonement. Argument the whole plan of salvation. Sure. It's, it's like some of the first simplest things come to mind, like the, the ceremonial law, the shadow of things to come, the types and antitypes, and how can it even enter his mind that it wouldn't be necessary. So why are we reading this? Because we're trying to understand the errors that we have made in this movement. We're looking at, because we're comparing, because this message of righteousness by faith, this is a study of righteousness by faith, but it's also a study of this movement. It's studying the things that we don't understand. And I'm paralleling what Wagner has done with what people have done in this movement in rejecting July 18, 2020. We have the okay. same species of objections to the truth. That is, people have objections to the truth right now in this movement, and they're the same. It's the same. History repeats itself. And so, yes. the people, so, so Wagner is just illustrating what we see happening in this movement today. Okay. That, we're wow. at. We're going to look at Jones too. We're going to look at where Jones went wrong, because mm -hmm. and I found by looking at where people have 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 gone wrong, that that has been a warning to me individually in my life as an Adventist and as a Christian, and even before I was an Adventist or a Christian, I looked at where other people went wrong, and I saw the results of their actions, and I said I don't want to go that direction, and I and I need well, to be aware. Well. That, that we're all, yeah. See, often what we do as humans is we look at other people and say, oh, I'm better than that. You know, and that's one thing I, would, I don't think. <laughs> Like, that's another one that kind of surprises me sometimes, that if I'm in those times alone thinking and quiet, that I can review my life and see selfishness in almost everything, almost everything, and okay. somewhere a root of selfishness. But uh, for for me to think that others are like that or imagine them being, I'm so naive that way as well. Like, I think yeah. the better of others. Well, the thing is, we have to learn from it. So anyway, let's go on and read here. Okay, so um, 
So he says here, Seventh-day Adventists do believe in the forgiveness of sins. At least it is taught in the denomination and is believed by many. But forgiveness obtained only by the reception consciously of the life of Christ, which is given freely on the cross for all men. We are justified, made righteous, freely by his grace, through redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. This forgiveness is reconciliation to God, for it was our wicked works that constituted our enmity to God. And Christ has reconciled us in the body of his flesh through death. Colossians 1, verse 21 and 22. Justified by his blood is same as reconciled by his death. And this is the atonement. By Christ, we have now received the atonement. I know that there is an attempt uh, to evade the truth. This is what Wagner's saying. Now, the thing is, we, we can agree with him. But the thing that one thing that we do not see is even though we individually can experience this, there does come a time in the world in which these things do come to an end, that there's this great controversy. And of course, he's not considering that. So as an individual, anybody can come to Christ and, and receive reconciliation to God, but that doesn't make an end of sin in the world. So he says, I know there is an attempt to evade this truth by using the word reconciliation, which is given in the margin. But the fact remains that reconciliation and atonement are identical. And I would agree. Uh, reconciliation implies previous enmity. In this case, the enmity was all on our side and we were enemies of God, who is the friend of sinners. It is we who are reconciled to Christ by the destruction of the enmity that was in us. Once we hated his ways, now we love and yield to them and are at one with him. We have received the atonement, namely the life of God in Christ. And Ellen White would agree. She says the same thing. So this is not an argument against the Day of Atonement, because the Day of Atonement is not about what happens to us individually. It's about what happens on a universal level. It is a period of time in which God is uh, presenting truths to the world that will then lead to a point where you will have one group of people who God can declare as righteous and all the others he can declare as wicked. We don't have that today. We don't have that clear distinction where God can have a group of people that he can trust, 144,000 of them, right? Yeah, Adam and Eve were in harmony, but they weren't ever, well, I guess they kind of were at odds with each other. Anyway, and this is the blotting out of sins. Now, he says this, that is not true. So how can he say that this is the blotting out of sins? Well, he says, how can it be otherwise? When the enmity is destroyed, slain, and the enmity is the body of sin, it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul, and this blood of life is not divided. I'm sure you still sin, uh, sin with as much fervor, or sing as much fervor, I think. Sing, yeah, sing with as much fervor as when you used to sing it together 28 years ago. Amazing grace, to heaven below to feel the blood applied. And I hope that sometimes even yet Adventist congregations join in singing in the old hymn book. But again, he's talking about the individual. Now, when we have the blotting out of sins, uh, do we still have a remembrance of sins? That is, when we, when we go to Christ, do we still remember the sins that we have committed? Yeah. So, so we have, we have the memory, but when our sins are blotted out, we cannot bring them to remembrance. Right. So so there is a work that has to be done where there'll be no more conscience of sins. So there, there's a work that has to be done. And, it, and it, to me, it's just absurd that Wagner can can make these types of arguments. But people do this when you reject God, when you reject the truth, you go into a darkness that you can't even perceive that you're in darkness. Uh, so he quotes another one, Christ hath for sin atonement made. And we agree with that. Christ made atonement for sin when he died on the cross. Every one of us believes that. So I, I don't know why he would make this argument. So uh, we have received the atonement. We should not dare come to the, into the presence of God as lawbreakers, knowing that our sins were charged up against us. We can come with boldness to the throne of grace when we have this gracious assurance and invitation. I blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. And and we can say that the God has, in a sense, blotted out our sins. He, he's, he's put them behind his back. But we know 
that we still remember our sins. God's not holding them against us. But the Day of Atonement definitely points to a time when the sanctuary is cleansed. And the sanctuary has to be cleansed, according to Paul, in Hebrews chapter 9. Because the blood of bulls and goats could cleanse, uh, you know, they, they would we would receive forgiveness for sins through blood in the earthly sanctuary. But he says the better the heavenly sanctuary has to be cleansed with better sacrifices than these. And that is the sacrifice of Christ. So he goes on, he says, I think there's no disagreement as to the fact that the blotting out of sins is the atonement. Yes, but that, that doesn't really bring any objection to what we're saying about the day of atonement. So he says, what I object to is the denominational teaching that this is only a book transaction. Okay, do we teach that it is only a book transaction? Does anybody believe that? Uh, I might see how it could look like that with uh, uh, all the learning and notes. You know, what he means is it's just something that happens in, in heaven, in the record books of heaven is what he means. Oh, I see. So, so, so we have analogies. We have a disease analogy. We have a legal analogy. What was the other one that we had? Um, we have a book transaction. A debt, right? Something that's a debt. These are all analogies. They're metaphors. They're parables. Is there actually books in heaven in the literal sense? And is are these things that are, you know, we, we can talk about, you know, names being crossed off and so forth. But we know that that's not actually real, right? We should know that. Like, God doesn't actually have literal books that he writes in. So, so these are illustrations that we use to try to understand something. And, and we wouldn't take them literally. But we can understand that, that there is, our names are written in heaven. Jesus says, I've engraven your, you on the palms of my hands. Do we believe that Jesus actually has on the palm of his hands everybody's name engraved? No, we don't, right? So we understand it as a metaphor, as a symbol. So then he says that makes the atonement not a personal matter at all. Now, that's not true because we have the personal matter of the atonement, but we know that there is this universal matter. Does the universal matter of the sins of the whole world and all these things that are going to happen, do they take away from the personal matter? Do they diminish it in any way? We'd have to say no. Right. So that makes the atonement not a personal matter at all, but something which can take place without in the least affecting the individual concerned. And of course, that's ridiculous. It is like blotting out extreme hot or cold weather by breaking the thermometer. No, it's not. It's a terrible analogy. Right. We understand that the prayer of Christ, I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know that through Christ, we are connected to heaven. The work that he's doing in heaven is directly related to the work that he's doing now here on earth. That Christ could not be doing this work of the day of atonement if there was not a message that was addressing it. If there were not a people carrying that message, right? He can only, the work he does in heaven is directly related to what he is doing in the hearts of people on earth. Ellen White says that the true tabernacle that the Lord pitched and not men, and I can't remember the exact words, but it, it stretches north, west, east, and south, something like that, and encompasses the whole world. So we talk about the sanctuary in heaven, but she says the true tabernacle is God's people on earth. That is, what God is doing in heaven in the heavenly sanctuary is just a symbolic representation of what he's actually doing in the hearts of people. So when he cleanses the sanctuary, he's going to be cleansing the hearts of those people on earth so that he can confess the sins upon the head of the scapegoat. Now we know he doesn't literally come and 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 Satan isn't literally a goat, and he doesn't come and put his heads, hands on Satan's head, literally, and confess the sins upon him. And there isn't going to be a fit man leading him away into the wilderness. We know that at that, but we can understand it symbolically. And, and he has this inability to understand that these are symbols. Because his mind has become darkened. 
Yeah, Jeff? I just said it appears that way. Yeah. What possible difference can it make to a man what is done with a record of his sins written in a book when he himself has had them removed from him as far as the East is from the West? So you can see the ridiculousness of that question. Yeah, and, and Kelly brings up, you know, there was this argument in the 70s and 80s about the sanctuary in heaven. Was it made out of, you know, actual materials? Uh, which I always thought was a ridiculous argument because we know it's not. There isn't a tent there with, you know, skins and, and things like that. You know, it, it's representing his work. But somehow people thought if if there wasn't a literal sanctuary, then, you know, it undoes the sanctuary message. I'm not sure how they would think that. But they're thinking like Wagner is here. So anyway, Wagner goes on. He says, a sick man is taken to a hospital and treated. When he enters, his condition is noted. And every day that he is there, a careful record of his case is made. Every rise of temperature is set down together with every unfavorable symptom. By and by, he is discharged and cured. The record of the course of his disease will remain on file in the hospital as long as the hospital stands. But the man knows nothing about it. He is freed from the disease, and that is all that he cares about. Just as little can the man who is forgiven and cleansed from sin care for or be affected by any record of his former sins. In saying this, I'm not implying that there will be they will be there will be retained forever in the record of men's sins, uh, forever the record of men's sins. What I do mean is that the blotting out of sins is a vital thing in the, in the sinner himself and not a mere matter of bookkeeping. Well, so let's take his analogy here. So one thing we do know is that if if we're going to take it as sin is a disease and there is a a record keeping of a disease. Is, is there a reason that we would need to keep a record of people's illnesses? Now, this is, he's just thinking about the one man. But, but what about from a scientific point of view? Just imagine that science, you know, is actually doing what it's supposed to do. So we would keep records, let's say, of, of patients and their treatments. And, and with that information, we can actually help other people, right? So the records may not matter to that individual, but it can definitely matter in the long run. Now, it's not the best analogy in the world, but we know that there has to come a time when sin will be blotted out. That is, the cure for sin has to sort out, you know, what sin is, and it has to be demonstrated. So you have, you know, and it's, it's not the best analogy, but, you know, it's the one he's given us. So um, you're going to have a group of people who have been declared cured and they're not going to be sick again. And then you have a group of people have, who have not been cured and no matter what happens, they're not going to get better, right? That's the close of probation. So we'll look at it that way. So there, there, there needs to be in God's plan, he's working towards a goal to remove sin forever from the universe. And Wagner's not considering that at all. Not everyone is going to be saved. But yet God will have have to choose from among the people in the world to declare that some people are saved and some are not. And we have to trust that what God has done is real. And that will be demonstrated, not just to the righteous, but to the wicked. Okay, so we're going to stop there. I went a lot longer than I normally would. but. Um, We'll pick this up next week here. Okay, so let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study. Thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for each person searching for truth. And Lord, you know our hearts. You know the wickedness that is there. You know the sins that have to be removed. And so we submit to your care. We ask that you can heal us, and that you can make us to be like Jesus. We pray for one another. We know that uh, many of us face severe trials at the present time, some with our health, some in other ways. But no, we know, Lord, that you have a purpose in all these things. Help us to trust in you and your will. Be with us through the rest of the Sabbath, through the studies tomorrow. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.